This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Hello and welcome. I'm Claire Healy and you're watching the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media. We're breaking down the news in Amherst, Massachusetts for you every Friday at 6 p.m. A one-night-only outdoor projection exhibit took place on the back of Amherst Cinema in the parking lot behind A.J. Hastings on Friday, October 23rd from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The exhibit, titled Larger Than Life, was hosted by the Amherst Survival Center, Commonwealth Murals, and the Amherst Senior Center. Larger Than Life, which broke down into the Front Steps Project and Becoming, featured the photography of Isabella Delolio, who moved into the area a little over 20 years ago from Italy. Delolio started as a graphic designer and slowly transitioned into photography, a longtime passion of hers. She says she likes to photograph people. Becoming was a project about older adults, where she spent time with eight people before the pandemic and photographed their everyday lives. Another two she photographed during the pandemic. Uh, and two people, two of the ten that I photographed for the Becoming project, I photographed them after the pandemic. And so we only met outside. And you know, you can tell if you see the photos, they have masks and it's very different <laughs> thing. But I, I thought it was interesting to see the, you know, the before and after this really strange time. The project was originally meant to show in the fall at the Amherst Senior Center, but due to COVID-19, it was postponed. The Front Steps project started when the pandemic began. And more specifically, when the, quarant the first quarantine started in March, I came across an article from a photographer in, close to Boston <clears throat> and she created the project. She started the project and she did exactly what I did. Well, I did exactly what she did actually. <laughs> um, so she photographed family for a very short time of like 10 minutes outside their homes with no um, uh, physical contact, no interaction really, uh, no physical interaction and uh, from a very, very, very safe distance and uh, free of charge. She didn't make any money. And uh, in exchange for a, for, a for a couple of photos, the families would donate to a local uh, charity. And I, I had, and I started and I said, well, we'll see, you know. I had no idea it was, going to be you know become what it did that I, I had no idea that so many people would participate and donate so much money to the survival center the project raised around nineteen thousand dollars for the amherst survival center delolio says the exhibit went really well and that it was a great night it was it was really an amazing experience um to you know to be able to share all the photos with the people that participated in both projects all together it's yeah it was it was and and you know it was even i think it was even better than just having an exhibition like the you know the, the like the like photos on a wall right in a frame uh, the fact that it was like a slideshow you know with the music and it was really like a, like, like a nice long story to watch. And it was like someone was telling you a story. So I had a really beautiful feeling, a really beautiful feeling. The University of Massachusetts Amherst has announced its intentions to allow a significant number of students to live on campus starting in the spring semester of next year. A press release from UMass News and Media Relations explains that in addition to students with face-to-face -face courses and those dependent on university housing and dining, all first-year students and entering transfer students will be granted the opportunity to live on campus even if they do not have in-person classes. The proportion of students welcomed back constitutes roughly 60% of UMass's typical residential population. UMass Amherst has upheld its testing program as a determinant in its decision-making. The university stated it has the fourth largest testing and contact tracing program in the state only behind the cities of Boston, Worcester, and Cambridge. 
UMass added it has conducted over 100,000 tests since August and only has had a cumulative positivity rate of 0.15%, with only one positive case detected among the on-campus population. The rest, 160 positive cases in total, have primarily come from off-campus students in the Amherst area, with a small fraction of infections coming from staff and faculty. For those who will live on campus, they are required to adhere to a number of protocols. These include mandatory twice-a-week testing, daily self-monitoring, use of face coverings, prohibition of guests from residence halls, and limited travel away from the greater campus area. The Racial Equity Task Force in Amherst has declined the town's offer to participate in the selection process for the creation of a community safety working group. We spoke to Isolda Ortega Bustamante, a founding member of the task force, about this decision and the group itself. The Racial Equity Task Force formed in Amherst following the death of George Floyd, not as a single issue organization, but as a community-based group hoping to address a number of disparities around Amherst. It started with a focus on town council meetings and a desire to increase the support and representation of demographics in Amherst that may not have had as much of a chance to give substantive input. She detailed a number of elements of the screening committee that the group is critical of and said that while the task force is, quote, in no way against the committee, they were not in a position to participate and wanted to focus elsewhere. When the town council meeting was held at which the town manager presented the plan for this group, um, the document detailing the plan had been released, I believe, the midnight or um, the night before or that morning. So there hadn't really been a chance for residents to have substantive input in the plan. 413 group uh, made the point that they uh, did not want to uh, have the, um, the police um, officers or the police chief participate on that commission because residents would be intimidated to express themselves fully about their experiences. And that was heard, that was changed. But what didn't change was a screening committee, um, which would essentially have two only two slots that were not designated by the town. And there was uh, 413 invited to be one of those and um, the Racial Equity Task Force invited to be another. You know, we started to see this very top down managerial approach, which is setting up a screening process. Um, and then uh, there would be a report written. The report goes to the town council and they decide whether or not to have a commission now, um, that doesn't mean that there won't be um, some valuable work going on there, but when we look at um, all of us who work full time, are raising families, and have um, you know, a limited amount of time to volunteer, and where we are an umbrella for a large spectrum of issues, and you have other organizations specifically focused on policing, it didn't make sense for our time um, to serve on that. Uh, screening committee. The focus of the task force right now is on the one hand to very much stay in touch with um, the national movement against anti-black racism and in solidarity with uh, black uh, indigenous Asian American Latinx and other people of color um, at the same time um, you know for foreground for younger people, that um, movement that's been here, the history of these movements in Amherst, all the work that's preceded us, and then create a space. You create a space for young people, for newer populations, for others to begin to express these concerns. And that work takes time. And so it didn't, it didn't feel at this moment that the screening committee was really the best use of our time. She said the group welcomes residents to join them and that they can keep updated with the group's activities on their Facebook group. Continuing last week's series of spotlights of local professors in Indigenous Studies, we interviewed Professor Manuela Pick, Professor of International Relations at Universidad San Francisco de Quito, and Lowenstein Fellow at Amherst College. She researches Indigenous politics in international relations and world politics, as well as sexuality and world politics, and says she often works at the intersection of Indigenous women and world politics. She has written three books, Vernacular Sovereignties, Indigenous Women Challenging World Politics, Sexualities in World Politics, and Queering Narratives of Modernity. 2004, and I've been very involved with Indigenous peoples and politics. There is an Indigenous political party in Ecuador, 
Pachacutic uh, that has uh, led many indigenous activists, lawyers, intellectuals, peasants to the forefront of politics, to Congress, to the Foreign Affairs Ministry, and as presidential candidates. And since 2008, I've been coming to Amherst on and off, teaching as a visiting scholar in the departments of political science and sexuality and women and gender studies, and often at the intersections of indigenous politics and indigenous women in world politics. When asked what she would like people to understand about that field of indigenous peoples and world politics, she said that, quote, indigeneity is important to everybody and not just indigenous people. Indigenous peoples in the U.S. have been erased everywhere we have had genocide, but in North America, there's a specific narrative of erasure, right? The last of the Mohicans. Uh, this narrative implies that indigenous peoples are something from the past. They don't exist in the present. And they're certainly not political actors in the national or international realm. In Latin America, it's a little different. We do have a very strong indigenous presence in many countries. They have political parties. And in some countries, there are even presidents, right? Evo Morales was president for three terms in Bolivia. So it's much more visible, contemporary, and contestatory in the south of the continent. In either case, what makes indigeneity important, whether they're actively participating in politics or actively or tangibly visible by the dominant society, is that indigeneity is a relational category of analysis. It doesn't exist in and of itself. Indigenous peoples are not indigenous, what we call indigenous, right? What states call indigenous are Maya, Maya Kakchikel, Maya Kekchi, Kichwa Guarani, Yanomami, Cherokee, Shumash, right? So the um, native peoples refer to themselves with their own nations, names. And indigeneity is a very homogenizing category that was created through colonial processes. She reflected on the experience of watching different students learn their positionality and the positionality of indigenous women in world politics in her classes. And then there are other people um, who you think would not care and yet who identify. And so one example is that I, last time I taught a class on indigenous women, there were indigenous women in the room and there were uh, two veterans of war, white men, heterosexual men, uh, veterans of war. And I would have think, thought that the, these two guys would not get as easily the positionality of indigenous women and their experience and how they matter for world politics. Yet they were the first ones after the native women to understand because as veterans, they understand firsthand by experience what it means to be a disposable body, right? To be sent to the front, to be sent to war just to die. So there was actually a really interesting connection among unexpected actors and switch in their heads to think the political, to think borders and the role of the use of force. The two areas she focuses on that she said are urgent and increasingly prevalent in world politics are violence against Native women and the issue of water rights. So the first topic would be violence against women and in North America in particular the missing and murdered Indigenous women. In Latin America we speak more in terms of femicide and Indigenous women are at the forefront of those femicides. It's a really important topic because there is a correlation between bodies and territories, right? The body is the first territory or the last territory, depending from where we start. But the rape and killing of native women is uh, part of the process of the appropriation of land and the land grab, the dispossession. Right? It's part of the politics of conquest. So I'm very interested in, in sexuality and, and why the sexual violence against native women is so invisible um, in every context, you look at the United States in 2016, there were five, over 5,700 cases of missing and murdered indigenous women reported, but there are only 116 that were logged into the database of the Department of Justice. So there is an active erasure of the violence, right? So what does that mean, right? And what does it say about the states we inhabit, which we assume are democratic states, we assume are uh, 
promoting human rights from their narratives, but then you realize they're actively disappearing entire populations. And the second topic that's interrelated and that was at the forefront with the um, Standing Rock protests a couple of years ago is the issue of water. Um, the, terri the dispossession of indigenous territories, which have been ongoing for the last four centuries, five centuries, is particularly tangible in the expropriation and the dispossession of water. Because even when indigenous people can remain on their territories, the, their lands or their rivers or nearby rivers are being sold to extractive industries, whether it's a mega dam, an oil pipeline, an oil extraction or fracking plant or mega mining, right? There is a pollution of water. And the pollution of water is a, it's, it's a politics of killing. You're, to, you're extracting resources and damaging, right? L sending death and pollution and toxic waste into nature, into the communities, into the bodies of children and mothers. Pick says in activism around these issues, what is indisputably necessary is self-determination which she calls a fundamental political tool to move forward. The self-determination of indigenous nations over their rivers, right? The Maori in New Zealand have been defending one of their rivers um, for 160 years and they finally got authority over their river. Um, and they say, I am the river, the river is me. This notion that we are part of nature and we are not masters of nature, which is a philosophy that most if all indigenous nations share in all of their diversity, right, is very, it's anti-extractive. And it's only by promoting and respecting indigenous rights to self-determination, right, to prior consultation, to prior consent over any mega projects on their territories, right, to ask them if they're willing to have a mega dam, to have an oil plant on their territories, to let them protect the rivers. Only that way we will be able to protect rivers. For anyone hoping to learn more about violence against Native women, water rights, or any of the issues discussed, pick us one clear recommendation. Read Native authors, watch Native films, listen, hear, and learn. Watch Native, native films, listen to Native music. You'll feel through the arts, through poetry, through ideas, the thickness of the history, the perspectives, and the value of their knowledge to face the climate crisis that we're all inhabiting now. Um, we all have a responsibility as non-Indigenous peoples to learn, to listen. It's not that Indigenous stories and experiences have not been told, they have been unheard. They're not untold. There is a resistance to listen, to hear uh, in this, narratives of indigenous erasure right in a politics in a genocidal politics of erasure so the first thing non-natives can do is to listen to hear and to learn in her current work she's working on a book she co-wrote on the significance of indigenous state relations and says she has been writing recently about indigenous sexualities and the defense of water rights in indigenous communities because we're a lot of political scientists in theory, in international relations, in comparative studies, they're discussing the collapse of sovereignty, the crisis of the nation states. They talk about globalization, about the European Union, and everybody's discussing how the state is in crisis because of the capitalist crisis, because of extractivism, because of globalization. And yet there's another perspective we're not looking at, which are indigenous perspectives, which are relocating state sovereignty and forcing changes in the essence of what legal authority is, but from within, right? Because indigenous nations are not competing to be other nation states. They want to be a different political system. Finally, election day is next week, November 3rd. If you have not yet voted, voting on Tuesday is open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Following today's episode, we will be airing a special edition of the Amherst Weekly Report, which focuses on a restorative justice program being implemented in Western Massachusetts. So stay tuned. This has been the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media. I'm Claire Healy, and we'll see you again at the same time next week.